welcome to our Friday morning meeting. Um, we, um, we have a couple of guests with us uh, to, um, to lead off with. Um, we have uh, Catherine uh, Jennings uh, from Fish and Wildlife, as well as Kristen Haas uh, from the Ag Agency. And uh, they have a, an issue uh, that they'd like to talk with us in regards to H656. And they're kind of limited on time. So we'll get right to their sections of the bill. And uh, you could explain to us uh, what uh, you'd like to change. Uh, I guess, Kristen, you want to, Kristen, you want to start off first? Sure. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay. So Kristen Haas with the Agency of Agriculture. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, provide the committee with a little bit infor of information about um, H656. Uh, the Specifically, there are um, two paragraphs in this bill that are uh, related to or part of the what we've affectionately dubbed as the swine language in the bill. So, um, and if you're looking at uh, the bill that, that I'm looking at is um, version 3.2. And if you are, if you're looking at that bill, then um, this, uh, these couple of spots, uh, the first one would be on page 27 of that bill. Um, Oh, and Linda, you put up the shorter version. Okay, so then in that case, um, in, in so this is an excerpted set of language from version 3.2 of H656 that Linda has on the screen. So on that version, it's page three um, is the first first spot. Let me, let me just jump in here because, uh, uh, Kristen, excuse me, but the chair sure. wasn't with us uh, uh, when we met last. Okay. And so I was chairing and we did not get this far in the bill. We got about halfway through the miscellaneous bill. This is okay. a little further. So I just don't want you to assume we we're conversing in, in the language because we haven't looked at it yet. Got it. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so just maybe then to back up for a moment, um, this language uh, we had requested and, and obviously had talked with the House Ag Committee about, um, it stems from a desire uh, on the part of the Agency of Agriculture and the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, as well as our federal partner organization, partner agency, uh, USDA Wildlife Services, to try and get some greater clarity around um, a circumstance that happens occasionally and most recently happened in 2019, last year, um, where there was a, uh, own, a livestock owner whose pigs got out and were free roaming for a period of time. Um, and we found in trying to manage that situation, which uh, fortunately we were we were able to do collectively between those three departments. But but in doing so, um, we found identified some gaps in our regulatory authority and technical assistance authority um, that this language we hope will uh, close and and provide clarity for everybody. So that's sort of in a nutshell the origin of this section of the bill that you. Are all, all are contemplating. And um, we, again, worked with Michael and um, the House Ag Committee to uh, fine tune this language. Um, I think that the two items that we would still like to see uh, changed in this draft are in effect housekeeping changes within our housekeeping bill. I, they're gonna be more meaningful to, important to the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Agency of Agriculture than they will to any external stakeholders. So they really truly are housekeeping type changes. Um, so with that being said, then on either page three of the version that Linda has posted or page 27 of the bill in its entirety, um, you will see on uh, the paragraph starting on line four of either of those pages, um, a statement about uh, that pertains to the definition or what we would like to see for a definition of feral swine. 
And specifically, um, paragraph C, starting on line four, talks about the possibility to do genetic uh, analysis on pigs to make a determination as to their lineage. And um, in talking with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, we collectively agreed that because times things change over time and the labs that are available to do this testing and the type of testing that gets done uh, changes over time, we would like to see the second sentence in that paragraph just struck to allow for flexibility. Uh, if say five or 10 years in the future, uh, it no longer is the National Wildlife Research Center that's doing this testing on behalf of these federal programs, we could then have flexibility to utilize testing capabilities capability at a, at a different lab. So that's the, our, that's the basis behind um, wanting that level of specificity struck from this particular paragraph. It doesn't change the intent, it just makes things more flexible and allows um, this language to evolve along with the, the uh, technology that may evolve in, in the future. Yep. Any questions uh, from the committee on this particular section and the deletion? No, I guess we're good, uh, Kristen. Okay, great. Um, so then the second of the two things wanted to draw your attention to are um, either on page five of the excerpted version that Linda has up and uh, Linda that's starting, yeah, the, the highlighted piece, or this is on page 29 of version 3.2 of the bill in its entirety. Um, so this section uh, talks about basically the justification for wanting to manage escaped swine. And we're not talking about pasture raised swine that are enclosed within a fence or some type of other enclosure, which is was a fairly popular way for farmers in Vermont to raise swine. What we're again talking about here would be swine that are free roaming onto public lands or other private property and, and the need to manage those animals. Um, in, so again, in talking with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, we would like to propose striking the second sentence in that paragraph. And the reason is because um, these, uh, if it is determined that um, there is a situation that we need to collectively manage, these communications between our two departments, as well as USDA Wildlife Services, which which plays a huge role in these types of situations, they're gonna happen anyway. And we thought it redundant to mandate that in statute and take up extra room in the green books to do so when we're gonna be having these conversations among our three departments and agencies regardless. So again, another sort of just clean up housekeeping uh, proposal that that second sentence uh, stating that, yeah. our, that the Department of Fish and Wildlife has to consult with these other partners that they would already be doing consultation with, um, we would propose to, to strike that. Not changing intent, but just getting rid of extra words. Uh, Chris? Kristen, is the, uh, uh, has this issue ever come up? You, you said there was an issue last year? Yes, yep. Um, it has come up a couple of times that I can recall off the top of my head. Certainly the situation last year was was the most significant um, one that I, I can recall. And that was a circumstance where uh, a, a farmer, um, again, pigs got out, uh, there was, not um, at the beginning of it, uh, not, not a lot of attention paid to trying to get them back in. Those pigs subsequently uh, were doing damage on other private property, neighboring properties. Um, we got a number of calls from disgruntled neighbors of this farmer. Um, the pigs also, I believe, were on um, public land as well, um, although not to the same extent as on private property. Um, it's it's it was resolved. Um, fortunately, the owner was cooperative and, and we worked, I think, very well with him to, to get his pigs back in. Um, he did not lose any pigs, which was a success. Um, but we do feel that 
uh, there, we, we spent a fair bit of time at the beginning of that situation trying to navigate with our, our attorneys, and perhaps Catherine can, can speak to this better than I can, but navigate with our attorneys to try and determine what our authority is to in, intercede and, and get, get the situation resolved. So that was, that, um, was sort of the most notable one. There have been other circumstances, and I, I didn't see this myself, but I know in other parts of the state, State and at least two on at least two occasions, um, there have been uh, domestic pigs that have been out and have have um, allegedly again I didn't witness this myself but have allegedly uh, d created some problems with kids at the school bus and chasing kids at the school bus and that sort of thing. So at the bus stop. So yes, it has happened before and and last year's incident really put the. <laughs> icing on the cake for us and, and, and bumped this situation up further in our priority list. And, and would you characterize the approach that you all have and the feds have as being the same approach or, or are there different sort of lines that trigger reactions? I guess I'm, I'm trying to think um, as, as our colleague, Senator McDonald, uh, reminds us occasionally we should think of these things as eighth graders <laughs> and what are you trying to uh, slyly change here if we don't require consultation with the federal partners so how would you characterize your approach is it identical uh, are there differences etc that's a great question and I'm, I'm glad you asked it because it's important I think to have on the record and and what I would say is that our federal partners, um, Wildlife Services, and they have offices here in, in state and human beings in state, we work with them regularly. They are not a, uh, a regulatory agency. They, they don't have a hammer in their arsenal. They, have, um, they can provide technical assistance. They, can, they have the expertise and the equipment to catch pigs um, and, and perform other tasks as well. So I think collectively our goal with this situation that happened last year and going forward would be first and foremost to try and work with the owner to get the pigs back in a contained area. And that is a uniform philosophy um, amongst all of us. So we're not talking about um, anything more aggressive than that at the mm -hmm. outset. Yeah. And as long as we have a situation where the farmer is willing to work with us, then that's the goal. I mean, I'm glad it wasn't videoed, but I, I remember distinctly <laughs> sitting in this farmer's field in, on the side of a trap and doing what he described as his pig call to get the pigs to come over to us so we could get them back in the trap. So we went to great lengths to not harm any of these pigs and, and not leave things in a, in a bad situation. So that, yes, that has been our approach and it's consistent between state and federal. And again, I don't know if Catherine has anything more to add to that, but that's how I would characterize it. I, I would wager that that video would have made you a Vermont celebrity. Uh, I <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm glad it doesn't exist, and um, I'm going to get some flack for it for a long time by our wildlife services partners, that's for sure. So <laughs> I'm glad it doesn't exist. Well, you Can you recreate it? No, I can't, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and all I all I remember seeing, well, I remember a lot of things, but one thing I remember seeing is David Alaben, who's the state director for wildlife services, just turning his head away. So he was kind of catty corner away from me so I could see his side and his back and his shoulders were just going like this because he was silent laughing at me. And I said, if you ever <laughs> share this with anyone. So anyway, that was that was how that went. So did you catch them or not catch them? We did catch them. It oh. worked. Yeah, yeah, it worked. We did catch them. I'll tell you what, those, I mean, an adult pig is a, a formidable animal. So yeah, we caught them, but um, they, they weren't happy about it. And they, they were doing quite well being out in the neighbor's property, rooting up their garden and, and all sorts of stuff. So yeah. So in the uh, in the bill where it says the department, does that that means ag and then you you work with fish and wildlife? Uh, is that the way that's going to work or? 
It actually, in, in the bill in this section, the reference to department is the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Okay, so that's Catherine's section. Yes, and the reason it is in this bill is because of the intersect and, and the types of animals that we're talking about, you know, being domestic pigs. We <laughs> have had feral swine in Vermont, but not very many, so. Are you sure that you don't want to take a second bite the apple, so you're going to have um, Catherine go and catch them the next time? <laughs> I, I would welcome Catherine's involvement in that. I don't know that uh, I'll leave that to her as to whether that would be on her list of her bucket list for a career um, accomplishment. <laughs> I don't know. So, Catherine, uh, do you have anything to add uh, at this time? I. I don't believe that I am as qualified as our state veterinarian, as Kristen, to uh, to do to take on such tasks. So that's number <laughs> one. Um, you know, just as a from a very simplistic point of view, the um, wildlife services and the Department of Fish and Wildlife really have jurisdiction over wild animals, and yeah. obviously, ag has jurisdiction over domestic animals. Um, and so this is. This bill in part um, really defines when a domestic animal can be controlled and under what circumstances. We obviously always want to return a domestic animal back to its, form, its owner, um, but we also need to have clear sort of lines of communication and, um, and authority to address those situations where uh, a domestic pig becomes feral and where we can actually define what constitutes a feral pig. Um, so that's what this bill does and we're very supportive of it. And I think um, given that pigs are really smart and um, can cause a lot of damage um, when they're out there, you know, in the wild for a long period of time, um, I think both the agency and the department um, think that this is a really effective way to move forward. Uh, thank you. Are there uh, questions? Good morning, Ruth. Good to see you. Um, the, uh, there are other questions in regards to these two uh, changes within 656? Uh, Ruth? Uh, yeah, sorry, I was late. I was in a childcare committee hearing. Um, uh, but is it just the pigs? Or was there another change that Kristen was proposing or what, on, on, on a different type of animal? It's just pigs. It's okay. just, just the pigs, just, just two, the pig. two little pieces within the, the pig language of 656. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. And then and it's, good to, to, it's good to make sure we're getting this under control. I know in other states, it's been a huge issue with domestic pigs turning feral. So um, thanks for addressing this. Yeah, and that's all it does really is it takes out the references to the federal fish and wildlife uh, uh, people and, and gives it to our agencies and which they're in communications with constantly anyways. Um, so yeah, they're pretty, how come the house Oh, you didn't get to the house in time to get this changed. Is that right, Kristen? Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's how I would summarize it. There were a lot of different, this is a long bill, and I know there were a lot of different pieces floating around, and, and we, we did um, provide testimony on this section of the bill, but it, yeah, I think it just got lost in the shuffle. So we're hopeful that you will be willing to incorporate it here on the Senate side. Yeah, you could play. You could blame that on me. The the oh. agencies asked for it to be removed, and and I, I didn't do it. The the language was moving in two different bills. I took it out in one bill, and I didn't take it out in this bill. <laughs> well, I'm sure that it was just an oversight. It wasn't because you were busier in hack, right, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was my fault. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take the blame. <laughs> Michael, well, as Kristen was, said, you have to do your best pig call. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of crazy at the end of when we were in Montpelier for crossover and 
in all of that. And uh, so we'd be glad to um, take care of those changes. I don't see any questions from any of the committee members. So uh, thanks for bringing that forward and Michael will make the adjustments and we'll move on. So thank you very uh, much. Anything else from either of you? Nope. Or, or, uh, can I just can ask Kristen a question? I know at the, the end before everything hit the fan, um, there was, you were in, we were, we had a joint hearing, I think, I'm just remembering in room 10 and we were talking about the animal closure bill or animal uh, shelter animal shelter bill is that yeah. a thing still is that coming to yeah. us did that ever we have we have that we have that bill i think it's 254 something like that as uh h254 okay. uh and we'll be we'll be dealing with that bill along with uh 656 okay so we'll have kristen back in on that one then and that and, uh, and if if there do you recall Kristen if there's any changes that we need to address in that part of the bill uh <laughs> I don't I don't recall any I I know that we um um as Senator Hardy mentioned the, the last time I think we provided input was uh, during that joint that joint meeting um, and it was with the livestock care standards advisory council members and yeah. we went through at that point a couple of again small seemingly nitpicky but meaningful changes and I, I believe that those were uh, incorporated so I'm not aware of any further um, changes that need to be made to that and uh it's good to know that you you will be taking it up yeah yeah and i i put both of those bills on our list that we wanted to deal with okay and so and was there there was also the issue that came up in that meeting about the um the um calves the baby calves situation and you were going to come with some recommendations perhaps or talk about it with that livestock advisory council and i'm wondering if there's anything that you're recommending that we could put into this bill or is there already something somewhere that's drafted i don't know uh there there's not any recommendation at this point okay. and there is nothing drafted that i'm aware of um oddly enough in the midst of all of the state of emergency and the crisis that we're all in um i've gotten reports back from our one of our animal health specialists who uh, who does the market reporting at the livestock market here in Vermont, as well as over in Cambridge, New York. And he's reporting that, um, that, and this maybe won't be a permanent change, but that things are seeming a little bit um, better with the calves at the moment. I think partially driven by the fact that the prices for, for cull dairy, as well as um, calves have come up a bit so um people you know have responded a bit to those market drivers and have been at least anecdotally seem to be hanging on maybe to those calves a little bit longer so i i think um i think we need to do some more work within the livestock council to, to, to determine whether legislative a, a legislative fix is really the best way to go or whether that is a, a something that the market will drive and, and the education and providing outreach to folks is a better solution so that we're, we're we're we haven't forgotten about it but nothing to recommend at this point great thank you yeah thank you thank you uh both for being with us this morning and um uh, when we uh you know, get to these sections. Well, Michael's with us anyway, so he's got it um, under control. And uh, so we'll deal with it. Uh, and thank you both very much. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye. So uh, getting back to um, Chris, back where you guys left off, on 656 um uh did you you want to pick up at that point and maybe I, well, michael, yeah and michael uh you have where uh the committee left off um 
on on running through six five six um, the other day. Ruth, uh, would you be able to meet on Tuesday into the noon hour? Uh, we're going to have uh, Anson can can come and meet with us. Um, I tried to get him on earlier to talk about the Recovery Act, but he's uh, going to be tied up, he said, with the governor's office. So I was wondering. Uh, he can be with us at noontime on Tuesday, and if you could work through the other four, three can work through the noon hour to some point. I shouldn't think it would take more than a half hour or so. Yeah, that's so, fine. I can do that. So would we yeah. start at noon or start right after nope. the floor? Uh, well, we're going to... We're going to start right after the floor on Tuesday with our committee meeting. Okay. And then, but we'd have to run a little bit into the noon hour to accommodate uh, Anson. That sounds good. And, and the main reason I'd like to do it Tuesday is because Wednesday we've got a joint meeting was set up. Um, from ACCD in regards to the recovery uh, money. And that's gonna be Wednesday. And I think it'd be good for us to be versed on the ag stuff prior to getting into that meeting. So that's where we are and, uh, and uh, we'll uh, move forward. Any questions on on that from anybody? No. So we'll uh, we'll get right back to where you folks left off, I think on Wednesday, maybe. Uh, well, good morning, Michael. Looks like you uh, had a good shave this morning. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, how, how are you feeling? How, how, how would the operation go? Uh, they just took my eye out and I've got a little black patch. I'm going to be able to know it went very well. Yeah. Uh, I can actually read without glasses now and, and, uh, well, as good as I can read, um, no, <laughs> no, it, it went very well and my eye is sore, but you know, that isn't a problem. Um, I can see see really well with it so that's great good to yeah. hear and um so anyways i'm glad to be back and and rocking and rolling so, okay um so, so on uh, on wednesday you stopped the committee stopped on page 17 section 16 of the version of the bill that's posted on the committee's website um I'm hoping that Linda can put that up on the screen or or make me a co-host so I can share. So here Did, it comes. Before you start, Michael, are you are you going through a section and then discussing it to see if it's fine and okay, or are you just going through it without too many questions? Uh, I've been summarizing it for the committee. I've there have been questions. I'll leave it to the vice chair to say if you've been approving it or not. Uh, Chris, have you been have you been like okay in these sections as we went, or questioning sections if committee members had questions and going to go back to them or? Maybe Chris is missing. There he is. All right, sorry. We were um, we were just sort of rolling through it, um, understanding what they were doing, and I think not actually having a lot of questions, but we would have been doing them as we went. Is that what your question is? Yeah, and sort of approving them or needing or asking Michael to 
you know, put a check mark there. We got to go back and fix something or talk about something. Uh, we wouldn't have dared to do that without you, Mr. Chair. Uh, but come uh, on, you know <laughs> I've got a lot of faith in you guys. Uh, so, uh, anyways, uh, well, uh, is, so no, is we, we we were we were just cruising through it uh, for an initial introduction. That that was yeah. okay. So sorry to interrupt you, Michael, but sure. let's, let's go. So you're on section 16, page 17. Uh, there would be a new section that would be added to the ag water quality uh, chapter. Currently, there are farms that are importing onto their farm, things like food uh, residuals, uh, and putting it into their digester or into their manure pit. Um, the Agency of Natural Resources was previously tracking that, but their authority is over waste, and they've come to, to revisit their opinion about whether or not this material is waste. They're, they've now concluded that it's not because it is subsequently being used as either a, a production input for, for a digester or for nutrients in a manure pit. So they're no longer going to track it. The Agency of Agriculture would continue to, to like to track it and know when it's happening. So the first thing the section does is define what they're going to track. They're going to track non-sewage waste, which any waste other than sewage that may contain organisms, pathogenic to human beings, but does not mean stormwater runoff. And so that's basically going to be food substrates and some things like glycerin and, and other things that are that that may be put into these digesters or manure pits. It's not going to, to extend the agency's jurisdiction over the land application of sewage and, um, and biosolids. A&R is going to continue to regulate that. Um, so then you go down to sub B, uh, the Secretary of Ag may require a person transporting or arranging for the transport of non-sewage waste to a farm for deposit in a manure pit or for use in a digester to report to the Secretary one or more of the following, the composition of the material, uh, including its source and the volume of the material. And then after receipt of that report, the agency may prohibit the import of non-sewage waste onto a farm upon a determination uh, that, it, that the import would violate the nutrient management plan for the farm or otherwise present a threat to water quality. So why is, um storm water in there because I know ag does uh non-point right and yep. a and r does point source so why so, is there a reason why storm water is listed in there right so th there are you would think everyone would know what sewage is and that there'd be a uniform agreement of what sewage is but there's a few different definitions of sewage uh -huh. in statute and this is to clarify, one of those definitions says that sewage includes stormwater. Mm -hmm. um, and so they just wanted to be clear that for the purposes of this de definition, sewage isn't going to include stormwater runoff um, under 10 VSA 1264. It's yeah. because of the multiple different definitions of sewage that are in statute and, and being clear that it's not going to include the one that has stormwater in it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. What uh, could we scroll up, Linda? What? Um, thank you. So there, there's a. I, I'm just noticing this step here. The agency may uh, require. Actually, scroll a little bit more, Linda. Thank you. May require a person transporting a ranging transport. That basically they they have access there. To understand what is on what is being transported, and after that, they can intervene. Um, Correct. But that hinges to the transport, not the act of burning something in the digester. And I'm I'm just it just seems a little. Uh, I'm a, I'm intrigued. Like if it was if it was my digester and I was transporting. Uh, can you just help us understand why that's the only nexus? 
Well, the digester is already regulated. Okay. Um, the the production of of energy from agricultural inputs on a on a farm is farming, and it's regulated by the agency. Um, it also has some overlapping regulation with um, <laughs> if it's connected to the grid to the PUC. Um, so so what about things like air quality. Um, th there are some requirements for digesters and air quality. I'd have to go back and revisit them. Um, uh, my recollection is, I, I don't even want to, I, I have to go back and revisit the air quality. It's but been a couple somebody, of years since I looked at that. But somebody's on top of that, you think? The, there, there, there are requirements for, for the emissions from, from a digester. I don't even want to characterize the scope of them because it's been so long since I've looked at them and, I, and I'd have to go back and, and double check that. I can do that for you. I'll make a note to do that. It's okay. I, I, you don't need to do that work. I, but uh, so going back to the transport, then that's that's really the the avenue, right? So the the it's basically um, the method for them to 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 monitor the tran the the income or the import of of the the material onto a farm. If they don't want it coming in because it would violate the nutrient management plan for the farm, they, that's what they would do. They would prohibit that transport onto the farm of that material. Um, if it's going to create a water quality problem, they would prohibit its transport. See that, uh, I don't know, that's been an issue uh, with putting milk in manure pits. It changes the makeup of the, of the, uh, manure pit and so when that happens it alters the manure management plan to spread how much to spread on fields and probably this is the same issue right they, they have to account for the the nutrients in the material and if those nutrients are going to somehow lead yeah. to a violation of the plan then then the the material shouldn't be imported onto the farm and if the transporter uh, resists and does not um, does not provide that that information what happens then uh, the agency has its general enforcement authority under title six chapter one um, for any violation of any law that it administers and enforces, to to halt. Uh, yeah, they they have the authority to issue an order to stop, um, and they have the authority to um, uh, assess penalties. Uh, it's it's their full suite of their general authority, All enforcement right. authority. Thank you. And Michael is in this section here. Uh, what about our food residuals that that people transport or farmers transport to their farms for chickens? Is this only waste that's going into the pit, or can we use could we use this section for something to deal with with our food residuals for chickens? Well, th this is only for the transport, and you'll see that on, in sub B to okay. a farm for deposit in a manure pit or in a methane digester. Yeah. This, this, this section and the, the food residuals for composting, the agency I think would like us to have a broader authority for um, kind of a residuals management program on farms, not just food residuals or, or these non-sewage waste, but there's um, you know, the ag plastics and, and things of yeah. that nature that, that, that they, they would, they would, um, and you may hear from them at a future date about uh, giving them authority to establish a program like that. But right now, this is just focused on those non sewage waste coming to a farm for a manure pit or, or a digester. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That damn plastic ought to be taken care of somehow. We've had an awful time for years with that. But anyways, let's roll. Okay.
Uh, then moving on to the next section, this is uh, a change to Title IX and the definition of what is local um, for the purposes of, of food. And I think uh, I haven't been in your committee on the school nutrition bill this year, but I think you probably have had some discussions about what is local. Yeah. Um, currently, this is a consumer affairs definition. It means that the goods being advertised originated within Vermont or 30 miles of the place where they are sold. Um, and so the, the agency is thinking that, that uh, there needs to be some greater detail um, and specificity for, for the type of product in defining what is local. Um, so they have proposed um, after coordination with the attorney general who enforces the consumer affairs provisions, they have proposed this change to what is local. First thing they're going to do is, is they're going to add some additional terms. So it's not just local, it's now local to Vermont, locally grown or made in Vermont. Uh, and then you should look at the definitions of what, a, what is a processed food. It's any food other than a raw ag product and includes a raw ag product that has been subject to processing, which includes canning, cooking, dehydrating, milling, or the addition of other ingredients. And it includes dairy, meat, maple, uh, beverages, fruit, or vegetables that have been subject to processing, baked or modified into a value added or unique food product. So that's what processed food is. And I bring this up because there's gonna be different standards for different types of food. So a raw ag product is any food in its raw or natural state without added ingredients, including pasteurized or homogenized milk, maple sap or syrup, honey, meat, eggs, apple cider, and fruits or vegetables that may wash, colored, or otherwise treated in their unpeeled natural form prior to marketing. So that brings you over to sub B. Um, and sub B, you'll see that the Wait, new uh, term. Michael, can I just interrupt? I just want. Claire, to, can you re reiterate the milk situation? So milk, as, as we know it, buying, you know, as consumers know it, buying it in the grocery store in those plastic jugs, that would be considered a raw agricultural product? Yes. Okay, even though it's not technically raw milk? Correct. Okay. Got it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so the first thing you'll see in sub B is those new terms, local to Vermont or made in Vermont. And then you'll see the old standard for what is local being struck. And then you'll see that it has to have the following meaning based on the, the type of food or food product. So the first one is for raw agricultural products local to Vermont. It means the product was exclusively grown or tapped in Vermont, is not milk, and was derived from an animal that was raised for a substantial period of its lifetime in Vermont is milk, where a majority of the milk was produced from Vermont animals, or going on to the next page, um, is honey produced by Vermont colonies located exclusively in Vermont when all nectar when all nectar was collected. And then you go down to the next, and so this is what for products that are processed food local to Vermont means the, means the majority of the ingredients are raw ag products that are local to Vermont and the product meets one or both one or both of the following. The product was processed in Vermont or the headquarters of the company that manufactures the product is located in Vermont. So you can have the majority of the ingredients are raw ag products that are local to Vermont and the product was processed out of state but the headquarters of the company that manufacture the product is located in Vermont. Who's going to, uh, and D, uh, Michael, who's going to be the, the B police? The B police? Um, the yes. B police, uh, to make sure all the nectar was collected in Vermont. Well, most of these, well, first, let's step back. What, what is this definition going to be used for? It's going to be used in one respect for the consumer protection aspect of it so that people aren't out there marketing products as local to Vermont or local Vermont products are made in Vermont. 
when they they aren't actually made in Vermont or local to Vermont. The attorney general has addressed those issues in the past. People have have labeled or marketed their products in a way that is potentially deceiving um, and leading a consumer to believe that it was made in Vermont. So I, I, I expect that, that that type of scenario or that type of um, can act will continue and the attorney general will be able to, to use this to provide more specificity or detail in their enforcement. Um, and that enforcement largely is, is consumer driven. I, I remember when Elliot Berg was at the attorney general's office, he brought into the committee um, things like uh, uh, the one I remember distinctly is he brought in um, uh, waffles that were made in Japan that said that they had Vermont maple syrup. Um, <laughs> and, and it was, it was clearly not, Vermont maple syrup and and um, so there there are products out there that are that are just plainly mislabeled and and he got a con complaint about it and he tried to follow up with enforcement so I think you'll you'll still see that type of of dynamic what this is also going to be used for and is to to help the agency and potentially nutrition programs and food local food programs. Um, kind of build boundaries about what is local um, and bringing it a little bit um, more home to Vermont and more specific to each of these products. Uh, I think that's a, a key part of why the agency wants to change this because I think they want to have a, a greater focus on what what it means to be made in Vermont for specific types of products. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, so I want to talk to me about the headquarters of the company is located yeah. in Vermont. So one of the things um, that comes to mind is hood milk. A lot of the milk is uh, created in Vermont, is milked in Vermont, then it leaves. Um, this is coming up in school, local, buying local in, in, in school lunches all the time. I don't think that they are headquartered in Vermont, but they do have a company, a presence in Vermont. So was that deliberate? I, I believe it, it was deliberate. I think it's it's about having a situs that the that the company is a Vermont company, um, and it, and not just a, um, a, you know, a branch of a of a Texas company. But it, what about so Hood is not not headquartered in Vermont and it's not processed in Vermont. So this hood, for example, would not meet this criteria. But right. Cabot is, it's some of it's processed in Vermont, some of it's processed out of Vermont, but is are the headquarters and technically in Vermont or are they in New York now? Cabot, uh, I don't know that answer. <laughs> they used to be headquartered in Vermont. I don't know if they currently are. But they're owned by they're owned by Agrimark, which Agrimark. is like what is, right. I mean, they're organized in Delaware. I don't know where they're actually centered. I think they're headquartered in Mass. Yeah, that's what I think too. Oh, really? I thought it was Syracuse, New York, or something like that. Yeah. Um, but well, so we had this conversation about butter, <laughs> Cabot butter, and whether that counted when we were doing the school foods bill. No, they uh, were. Their butter comes out of mass. Yeah, it does. Well, their, well, their, their, their butter is going to be a processed food, and we haven't gotten to the processed food, right? Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, actually, no, that is, we just walked through the processed food. I'm sorry. It, that, that is, that, this is the definition. I'm sorry. Okay. So but let's talk about Cabot Cheddar then, which is made in Vermont from Vermont milk. Does that count? But they're not headquartered in Vermont. Well, I'm not so sure that. Well, some some cabbage cheddar is made in Vermont. Some is not. 
Yeah. Right. So the product needs to meet one or both of the one, following. Yeah. Right. So product, if it was processed in Vermont, it, it is it is local. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? No, go ahead. Okay, Michael. Okay. Moving down to bakery products, beverages or unique food products. It has to the product is um, it has to meet two or more of the following. The majority of the ingredients are raw agricultural products that are local to Vermont. Substantial transformation of the ingredients in the product occurred in Vermont or the headquarters of the company that manufactures the product is located in Vermont. Yeah, any right. questions? Good. All right, so then when referring for this consumer affairs, consumer protection aspect of, of the chapter, when referring to products other than food, local and any substantially similar terms shall mean that the goods being advertised originated within Vermont. Yeah. All right, moving on to D. Um, and this, this is a kind of a, with the geographic location, how you can um, use a, a terminology or, or reference to geography and how that would be appropriately used. So local, locally grown or made in substantially similar terms may, may be used in conjunction with a specific geographic location, provided that the specific geographic location appears as prominently as the term local and the representation of origin is accurate. So if a local representation refers to a specific city or town, products shall have been grown or made in that city or town. If a local representation refers to a region with precisely defined political boundaries, the product shall have been grown or made within those boundaries. If local representation refers to a region that's not precisely defined by political boundaries, then the region shall be prominently described when the representation is made or the product shall have been grown or made within 30 miles of the point of sale measured directly point to point. Anyone have questions about that? Uh, yeah, I could think of New England would, you'd want to maybe put it on your box of crackers, but um, help us understand, uh, is this envisioning a hyper local, you know, Burlington, beer or or you know North, North Troy yogurt like what help us understand a little bit so i i think um it's it's both the hyper local issue and then it's both that that um the issue of some of the the products are being sold in areas where um you want to say local to the upper valley and it may have been produced in in new hampshire or you want to say um local to to you know the connecticut river valley and again you have it could be new hampshire it could be massachusetts um so a farmer that could goes to a farmer's market can say that their product is local even though it, it was produced in, in massachusetts Right, because it, if it's thirty miles from the point of sale, then then that's that's a legitimate assertion of the local nature of the product. All right, that's helpful. Okay. So this uh, would. Uh, I'm sorry, Brian. Didn't mean to jump. Just a quick one. Does that mean that it could cross international borders as well, as long as it's thirty miles? Um. That's a great question. I think technically reading this language, yes. I think someone wanted to say that it was local to the, I don't even know what they would use as the, the region. I don't either, maybe not reference. Um, I mean, I don't, uh, local to the border. I, I you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Okay. But and, I like that. The region, the Northeast Kingdom, Richie Westman down Lamoille County, which isn't part of the Northeast Kingdom, they're always trying to work into our region with something. So we would keep Lamoille out that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Michael, uh, I know you weren't in our committee when we were talking about the school lunch bill, but this was one of the issues was the, the 30 miles. And this would, if in some circumstance we were making requirements about buying school food that would have to be local, if there's a school district on the border of New York and they're buying their apples across the border and that we wanted to be able to include as local, this is the provision that would establish that as local. Is that correct? I, I, I think you could, yes, I think you could use this and say, well, first, I, I believe schools have the, to have the authority under federal law to define what is local for themselves. Yes. But yes. then you can set whatever the benefit is um, for, for the benefit you're going to provide. You can set what local is for that benefit. And I think you could say that that food that's grown that meets subsection D would qualify for that benefit. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, ne next section. There, there's an inventory exception at the end. A person or company who sells or markets food impacted by the section shall have until January 2021 to utilize existing product labels or packaging. Um, to come into compliance with the requirements. This just gives them the ability to use their uh, their existing inventory of labels. Should I move on? Yeah. Uh, then you get into the weights Should and that, measures. Yeah, uh, just a second. Do you think that date is out far enough so that companies can use up their inventory of packaging? Because if we don't get this done and well, it'll be done by July one, I guess. So six months is, do you think six months is long enough? Uh, you know, that'll probably depend on each producer. Uh, I know some people have a, buy their labels in kind of a year supply. Yeah. Um, so, I think it's that's something a, we may want to think about uh, that date. Yeah, we may want to make it like correspond with the fiscal year, uh, but we don't need to change it. You know, like for until June thirtieth of twenty one instead of January one, because of of labels that people have bought. Yeah, I would be okay with that, especially given the pandemic circumstances and supply chains being a little funky and stuff. So I, would you like to move that date to uh, July 1 of 21? Is that okay? Committee, any yep. concerns? Good? Fine. fine with me. Fine with me. Okay. Sure. Yeah, so why don't we do that, Michael, and that'll give them a year at least to utilize their packaging and stickers and all that good stuff. Okay. They need to. Will yeah. do. Thank you. So mo moving on into section 18, this is about weights and measures. As I think the committee knows, the agency of ag is the uh, entity that enforces weights and measures, which includes all scales weights, um, scanners, uh, pretty much everywhere throughout the state. Um, one of the issues that they're having is that when they go to inspect a scale or, or, or um, other type of, of mechanism that the, the, the owner is not making that available for them to inspect. Yeah, they had a wicked trouble last year with some, I think it was an oil dealer trying right. to check their oil meters. Can you scroll that up a, 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 yeah. a little bit more so we can read the, yeah, thanks. So, so what is being added, and I think Linda, you need to scroll up a little bit more, is to give the agency the authority Upon request by the secretary, the owner or person responsible for a weighing or measuring device shall make the device available for inspection during that business's normal operating hours and shall provide reasonable assistance as determined by the secretary to complete the inspection. So, so this, this addresses those situations. It's happened with oil scales. It happened with some, some truck scales. 
uh, where the people were not being cooperative and, and now they have uh, authority um, to require it. Um, and then that goes hand in hand with section 19. The penalties uh, that exist in law right now that the agency has for, for violation of, of weights and measures, they are fines uh, and, and imprisonment. So that there are criminal penalties and the agency is a little bit um, reluctant to assign criminal penalties for some of these violations. So they've asked for administrative penalty authority uh, and the ability to suspend uh, a regulated entity's license. Yeah. So in addition to other penalties, the secretary may assess administrative penalties for each violation of the Weights and Measures chapter. Um, that reference to 6 VSA section 15, that's the agency's uh, default administrative penalty authority. Uh, max distinct violation is a thousand. Uh, and then the, the max total penalty, I think is 15,000, but let me check. Can you scroll that up more? Uh, there we go. No, the, the max uh, total penalty would be 25,000. That's if you have a continuing violation, each day's continuance uh, can be a thousand dollar penalty. Um, so, so that's basically what they're, they're doing. They want to have the authority to, re to request or require the person that's in charge or in control of a scale to present it and cooperate with its inspection. And then they want to have some administrative penalty authority um, and the ability to suspend uh, or revoke a license issued under uh, Title IX for any violation of the chapter. Michael, until this language, they've been powerless. It's been a basically a volunteer. Uh, no, they're not powerless. Their authority is criminal authority. Yeah, they would have. Right, there is imprisonment uh, contemplated in that chapter for, for violation of the weights and measures um, provisions, which in some instances can be appropriate. You know, there, there, there are stores that have, have intentionally rigged their scanners or, or scales to, to provide them with, with a um, economic advantage. Uh, but the agency also wants some ability to assess non-criminal penalties. And that's what they're asking for here. Yeah. yeah that makes I, good. Think, I think that's a good move because then like that oil dealer, he would just go and hide on them and not get back the truck out of the building so they could, uh, you know, check the gallonage. And, you know, that's all baloney. And I think that's probably a good, a good move because you know, if you're down in, you know, Bennington County or, or you know, way off, and that's the last place you've got to inspect. And then you come back to Montpelier and you've got to go way down, you know, travel 150 miles or 100 miles to test that one, one outlet. It makes it kind of miserable. Michael, with this... Years. <laughs> Sorry, Chris, go ahead. I, I think they can call Sears. He'll take his gallon jug down there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you can see that well, though. <laughs> oh, Michael, does the, this doesn't eliminate the criminal, po the possibility for criminal penalties. It just adds the administrative penalties. Is that right? It, it just adds the administrative penalties. You can see on uh, page 22, <laughs> in addition to other penalties provided by law. Got it. Okay. So, so those criminal penalties still remain um, available to the agency. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Uh, so moving on from weights and measures, you come to the Vermont Ag Credit Pro Program. Um, I think you all know what the Ag Credit Program is at VITA. Yeah. Uh, one of the issues that's arisen is that as more farms get into farm tourism, they may need some um, financial assistance to set up their, their farm tourism operation. But 
the way that the statute is written for the ag credit program what the they can provide financial assistance for technically doesn't include agritourism oh. and you see that definition of a farm operation that's what they fund currently and if you read that definition you'll see that it technically doesn't include any agritourism yeah so what this section does is in, <laughs> it ends that definition to say farm operation shall also mean the operation of an agritourism business on a farm subject subject to regulation under the RAPs. So yeah. if you're a farm subject to RAP regulation and you have an agritourism business, VITA can provide you financial assistance. Yeah, I think that's a good move. Yeah. Are you guys all set with that? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, very good. Moving on, uh, this goes back to the testimony that you received at the beginning of this meeting from the agency and the Department of Fish and Wildlife. This is about the feral swine authority. The agency uh, summarized why they are looking for it because they um, have had some instances of uh, escaped domestic pigs and some instances of actual um, feral swine from uh, a captive hunt facility in New Hampshire crossing the Connecticut and they want the ability, the specific ability or authority to um, address those, those threats. So going to page 25, this is an amendment to Title 10. Uh, this is Department of Fish and Wildlife Authority for the Transport, Import, Importation, Possession and Stocking of Wild Animals. So the first thing that's done, um, there is already uh, a requirement that the Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife must issue a permit uh, for the importation or possession of certain live species of wild animals. Um, and uh, that includes feral swine, top of page 25. Um, and then there's a definition or really a further definition of what feral swine is. And it will now include a domestic pig that is outside of an enclosure for, for more than 96 hours and is free roaming on public or private land. So nice. in that scenario that, that Dr. Haas described earlier, if those pigs weren't um, recaptured and enclosed, okay. there would be um, some authority for the departments to deal with that. Feral that, swine is also. I'm, I'm that's a very um, short time, though. Um, uh, four days, and they're uh, they're feral. Yes. That's that's a pretty short period of time to to classify a domestic pig to be wild isn't it this is a recommendation of both the agency and the department of fish and wildlife um i don't yeah. be believe the house really talked about the time period when they're out of the enclosure i i mean i don't know but what what do you folks think four days is pretty quick uh, uh brian yeah thank you mr chair i'd like to hear from uh from Dr. Haas, I guess, if I'm reading that, it means that 95 hours would still be a domestic pig, but once they turn that 96th hour, something happens, and I don't know what it is that happens or why it's not a week. So there, she must have a reason. I just don't know what it is. Yeah, make a check mark there, Michael and, and Linda, and we'll, we'll get them back in, because that that seems pretty quick to me that a, a domestic animal would turn to be a wild animal. But any other, con see, hey, Chris and Ruth, I can't see you on the screen the way it's set up. So if, okay. you, have, if you have a question, just jump in. Okay, I have a, I have a comment. Um, yeah. Reading this 96 hours does seem short, and I wonder what the, the switch is like Brian does. On the flip side, 
my my understanding from talking to one of our colleagues who represents the district where those pigs uh, did get out is that there was a little bit of foot dragging about catching them and they did quite a bit of damage over the course of four or five days. Um, so it may also be just a, if the pigs are out for four days, they can really rip up a bunch of people's gardens and, and do a lot of damage. So it, it, it may not be something that changes in the pig, but just a time period after which they really, it, 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 providing an incentive to the, for the owner to, to corral them. But, but yeah, I think hearing from Kristen or others might be helpful for our understanding. Yeah, and, and we didn't ask if there was uh, administrative penalties uh, on this either, I don't think, earlier today. Are there, Michael? Uh, so this is in Title 10, and, and Title 10, Part 4, these are fish and wildlife violations. Fish and wildlife violations are criminal violations unless they are designated as a minor fish and wildlife violation. So anything in part four in Title 10 is a criminal violation. See, and they, that's, yeah, it's pretty, I mean, that's really bad. That's where you go to jail. We, we may want to talk to them when they come in about doing something about an administrative penalty uh, for pigs that are out for more than 96 hours or, or something like that uh, when, we, when we chat with them. Well, I, 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 I want to put a finer point on what I just said. I, everything I just said is accurate, but but this, this section really isn't about in, uh, imposing a, a penalty on anyone. It's about giving the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Agency of Agriculture authority to deal with feral swine. Uh, they feel that it's not clear uh, in statute what they are, are authorized to do. Oh. Um, the existing animals, livestock at large provisions in Title 20, the public safety, chapter is public safety title they are very antiquated um, they include things like uh, if your cow gets out and damages the cat co town common that you have to pay two dollars to the town um, <laughs> and that's that, a that, pretty fair deal <laughs> uh, so th they're looking for something that's very specific about feral swine and the threat of feral swine. And um, that's really what this is about. It's not about imposing a penalty on that farmer. It's about giving the department and the agency authority to deal with the threat. And, and Michael, um, are they completely barred from doing something uh, on the 70th hour? Like it, it, I gather it's a sort of right of possession almost that changes after 96 hours. So if they had to take the swine down, they'd be within their rights or whatever. But, but um, like if the farmers engaged with them after 12 hours, are they allowed to be part of that? Can you just help us understand some of that dynamic? Well, well, part of why they want authority is because under Title 13 animal cruelty law, the killing of an animal that is not yours without the permission of the legal owner is animal cruelty. Um, and it, it may even qualify as aggravated animal cruelty, which has up to, I believe, a 10 year prison sentence. So so they they want to be clear that they have this authority and that they're not going to to violate animal cruelty laws it is discretionary authority it's not if the the clock tolls 96 hours and one minute that they're going to go out and kill um the animals it it just gives them that, that authority they they would prefer to work with the farmer um, but if a farmer is unable or unwilling to, to work with them, I think they want the ability to, to manage the issue um, after that 96th hour. 
And that's just for the domestic pigs that have escaped their enclosure. There are animals that are, um, and you'll see the, the characterizations on page 25 sub B, there are animals that are not domestic that exhibit or actually they may have been domestic, but now exhibit one of the following skeletal characteristics. Um, if they have an elongated snout, they have shoulder structure, the razor back, they have hind quarters pro proportionally smaller than the four quarters, <laughs> uh, and they have vis visible tusks. So, so apparently domestic swine, if they remain out of their enclosure for prolonged periods of time can develop those characteristics and then can breed those characteristics. Sure. Um, and, and then there is the language that you saw a little earlier, an, an animal that's genetically determined to be a Eurasian wild boar, or Eurasian wild boar domestic pig hybrid. Um, this is the language that the agencies have asked to strike that reference to testing conducted by the National Wildlife Research Center. Yeah. Uh, but there yeah. are... At, there are animals in the United States that, that have been imported here for the purposes of hunting um, that have escaped their enclosure and that are Eurasian wild boar. You, you may have seen the um, picture of the super hog that someone hunted uh, or took like two years ago. It was close to a thousand pounds and yeah. Um, Taller, taller than a six foot man kind of thing. And so uh, there, there, are, there are animals out there um, predominantly in the Southeast, but uh, as I said earlier, there's a captive hunt facility in New Hampshire where some of these hogs are located. Yeah. Should I move on? Uh, yeah, we, we need to get done about 20 after so. People can get ready for the floor at 11.30. All right, so let's go to page 26, sub four. And this is really the authority that's granted. Any feral swine may be removed or destroyed by the department, the agency of ag, or USDA's APHIS Wildlife Services. Uh, uh, the department shall notify the agency uh, prior to removal. And then the department shall notify the agency of ag of the disposition of the feral swine. Any person who kills a feral swine shall report to the state game warden and shall present the carcass to the warden within 24 hours. And the state or its designee shall not be liable for any damages or claims associated with the removal or destruction of feral swine, provided that the actions of the state were reasonable and that the removal or destruction of feral swine shall be deemed reasonable where the department acted in accordance with subdivision four, the notice provisions the department determines that the swine is a threat to public safety, has harmed or posed a threat to any person or domestic animal, has damaged private or public property, or has damaged or is damaging natural resources, or the department determines that the swine constitutes or could establish a breeding feral swine population. In Vermont. And that, that last uh, subdivision five, that's where the agency wants to strike the consultation with APHIS. Yeah. Then you uh, get to... Go ahead, Michael. Section 22, that amends the animal cruelty chapter to say that activities uh, regulated by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, including the act of destroying feral swine in accordance with the authority you just walked through, is not animal cruelty. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the last feral swine section is putting a section in the public safety title that the General Assembly finds feral swine to have potential to create damage or destruction. Uh, in light of the potential impacts of feral swine, the Department of Fish and Wildlife may destroy or euthanize a feral swine in accordance with the authority that you just reviewed in 4709F. Um, and that's basically the feral swine sections. Yeah, and so we we have what about a few more pages we can pick up on later. Yeah, the the a uh, good part of what's left is the hemp bill that you passed out of your committee. Um, 
uh, coming back to you mm -hmm. on this, the hemp seed mm -hmm. bill. Okay. Uh, and then the ecosystems restoration working group making that, uh, giving it authority to continue operation for um, the next year. Yeah. Um, so uh, are we all, Chris? Well, did that require money, the working group? Uh, they did not give it money. The, I'm gonna read the feral pig thing. I might have a couple more questions. So I don't wanna say, call it good. It was a lot and uh, we did it fast, so. Yeah, yep. I, I, I expect you to revisit the pigs. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Um, so um, we'll uh, we'll quit here. We got to be on Senate uh, thing in nine, eight or nine minutes. Uh, yep, so, uh, yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I think we covered quite a lot of ground, and so we'll pick pick this back up. Uh, Tuesday along with if we do uh, we may do a quick run through on that 254 uh, I, I believe that's a number on the uh, housing or sheltering um, but anyways if you folks have anything that you want to get on the schedule uh, be sure and let Linda know and we'll uh, we'll plug it in uh -huh. so, See you on the floor. Bobby, uh, did yeah. you see the email I sent you after Wednesday? It was sort of our sketch of, of the discussion that we were hoping we would have around the dairy assistance and all of those uh, relief yeah. work. And it included some other ideas yeah. we could talk to. So. Yeah, we'll get on to that. Uh, you know, I hope next week I'd like to meet on a pretty regular basis uh, and we'll yeah. uh, we'll have time i think to get to all that um you know once we get the house bill out of the way we may even want to add some stuff onto the house bill that that uh is on your list um so anyways uh thanks and thank you michael and linda and uh we'll uh catch up in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye.